Hello and welcome back to the Dropping in Surf Show. My name is Rob Case. I'm a paddling technique coach located in Northern California. And today on the show, we're going to talk about the science behind the pop-up. Um, if, you, if you've never listened to this show before, um, just a quick rundown is that we try to bring a little bit of science, a little bit of math into this wonderful world of surfing that we all love. And hopefully by bringing a little bit of science and math, we start to help improve our performance and therefore have more fun out in the water. So before we get started on the podcast topic, I wanted to make an announcement uh, to everyone out there. Uh, I am resuming my member live stream calls. So those of you that are members of the level one online course, the paddling technique course, Surfing Paddling Academy. Uh, every month, month and a half, I'm going to come out with a live stream that you guys can attend. It's going to go in detail, uh, one of the steps of the eight step checklist and beyond. Uh, it'll be an opportunity for you guys to ask questions, get answers, uh, and it'll just be a time for us to connect uh, remotely um, if I can't you know, see you in person. Um, but if you were not a, a member of the live stream calls, don't don't worry. Uh, I've got something for you. If you are a subscriber of the newsletter, the monthly newsletter, uh, we're going to do quarterly webinars on paddling technique. Uh, and these will be a little bit more high level, but hopefully you walk away with something that, that helps you out in the water move more efficiently and effectively. And members of the live stream uh, I'm sorry, members of the online course are going to get replays of, of every one of the live streams for the year, plus the subscriber webinars. So they'll have access to everything. The subscribers of the newsletter, you'll get a replay, but you'll only be, have the replay for about a, a, a week before I have to take it down. Um, so whether you're a member or a subscriber, you're going to walk away with some information on paddling technique that should help you out in the water. So I just want to let you guys know that the, the first live stream is actually probably happening right now as I publish this podcast. Um, and the first uh, subscriber webinar is going to be starting in March. So um, if you're not a subscriber to the newsletter, just go to the website and uh, and look for the uh, newsletter that you can sign up for. It's totally free. Um, and it's just once a month I send you out some cool training, this podcast, um, and uh, any other announcements that I might have. Um, and then uh, if you are a member of the online course, you should have an announcement coming to you um, with the uh, login information for the uh, live stream. All right, enough of the, the boring announcement stuff. Let's talk about the science. So the science of the pop-up. Um, and the reason I, 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 I thought of this topic is uh, when I started teaching level two, um, there really wasn't a lot of science around the pop-up. And, and, and honestly, I try to teach uh, parts of, uh, of surfing that have a bit of science behind it so that we, we can always rely upon the facts and, and know that, you know, as new things come out, we can alter our techniques. Um, the pop-up in terms of technique, there really wasn't anything out there. There were a few studies here and there, which I'm going to go ahead and share with you today and talk about that began to formulate and change the way I thought about the pop-up. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I do have a, a, an exercise that anecdotally has helped a lot of my clients. And at the end of today's call, I'm going to not describe the exercise, but I'll describe what the goal of the exercise is. Um, so we're going to first start out by covering some of those studies that are already out there uh, and how it helps us. How do the results help us? Or how do they direct the way that we think about the pop-up and, uh, and, and, and then try to improve that aspect of the sport? Um, and then at the end of the, of the podcast, I'll, I'll explain to you the way that I think about the pop-up technique itself. Um, and just to give you a little hint, it's, there is no one set way of doing it. Everyone's brain and body moves a certain way. And so the exercise I teach, uh, fosters that, uh, more natural movement in you and helps you train it so that it becomes faster and faster, uh, and really more accurate. That's what we'll find out with these studies, which is actually more important. So let's dive right into it. So the, the studies, now, I'm going to have a caveat that 
all of the studies uh, were done on land, um, not water. Uh, though there was, uh, so there was one study that was done uh, on a wave. There's so there's one exception to it, but they didn't. They only timed the pop up. They didn't. Uh, they, they didn't assess the movement. They didn't do the force plates on the, on the board, that sort of thing. So there's, and they all, all these studies will say that they could improve, that they could improve upon the study and move on. And that's, that's science. You know, when we start a study, we always say what the limitations are and what we could do better next time. And that's, that's exactly how science works is that we know that, whatever study we result we get is not the end all that we can always improve on it. So um, almost all of them were done on land. So there is already a limitation that our movement on land is not the same as our movement in water. There are many other variables at play when we are getting up to our feet. Um, but I broke down the studies into three different categories. They're, they're strength related studies, which is the majority of them. But there are some really interesting insights in them that I, I want to point out. There is one mobility related study. It's an older study uh, back in 2010. Um, and then there are two biomechanic studies really looking at the movement and the kinetic movement, as well as um, the force of each step of the movement so there's a little bit of strength in there there's but there's I mean, the goal was more biomechanic um and so let's let's just dive into it so the first one i have up if you're if you're not watching this i'll just explain it the the, the title of it is called performance differences between sexes in the pop-up phase of surfing and this was done by uh, some researchers um, at the uh, California State University Fullerton, so Cal State Fullerton Department of Kinesiology, and um, this one was was fairly basic. They had a force plate that they would have um, participants do a dry land pop up on, and they measured the force output, the peak force output, um, the peak velocity, the, the rate of velocity development, and the relative power between men and women. And uh, long story short, uh, the men produced more force on the force plate than the women. Um, and I think, I don't think that's much of a surprise. Um, and so this just kind of sets the stage in general on in terms of gender that okay one is stronger than the other in this motion at certain parts of the motion but does that really matter it never answered that um it, it, there's some interesting things in here it says an athlete with less muscle mass may be at a disadvantage because surfers are required to lift nearly 75 percent of their own body mass off the surfboard in less than a second so again they're they're alluding to yeah there might be a disadvantage but but what's really interesting is the next study or the study after let me pull it up the next study i believe goes into that maybe being stronger might not be as it might be helpful at moving that body mass quickly and that's what the next study shows and which i'm going to bring up in a second but it might not be a, an advantage to the stability and control of the surfboard for when they land, okay? So, so we have to think that, we have to think about what the overall goal is. So when we get up to our feet, I hate using the term pop-up and many coaches out there will agree with me on that one, but we're just gonna use pop-up for now because it's the most common term that the overall goal is when we get up to our feet that we can control the surfboard that that we are still in control right we did all this work to paddle into the wave right we we we've we've we're now transitioning to planing if we're not already there and now we've got to get up to our feet and so i arguably and i and this is my philosophy is that Control trumps speed. The better you work on the steps to control your surfboard more, even if it's slower overall 
time that it takes you to do that, you're building better habits. All right. So, so for example, if you are wicked fast on your pop-up motion, but it takes you a while to stabilize or the board turns while you're getting up and you didn't want it to turn. That's not, po- that's not a positive outcome. That's a negative outcome you lose control. And so you need to take time or you might lose the wave. That's building bad habits. But if you were to take just a little bit of extra time while doing the motion to stabilize and have control of the surfboard, the more you do those steps, catch the wave, get to your feet, find stability, then turn or then go in surf, right? If you do those three steps, in that order with control in time it will speed up and you won't lose the wave as often if it starts to run away from you but if you are so concerned about the wave running away from you and this is mostly a problem at beach breaks right because you always feel like you have to rush down the line but if you are rushing down the line you're rushing to get to your feet because you think speed is the number one thing i don't think that's right And that's just my own philosophy, my opinion. And some of these studies start to speculate that maybe some of the results of these studies are leading towards that, that control is more important. So let's get into the next study. The next study is our friend. um, It's led by a a lot of different researchers here, but uh, one of the names that I recognize that we've used research before for paddling is Jeremy Shepard, Dr. Jeremy Shepard. And this was a collaboration of the the Surfing Australia High Performance Center, um, the uh, Edith Cohen University, uh, the Cana- uh, Canadian Sports Institute Pacific, uh, and the Edinburgh Napier University. So this is a collaboration of all those researchers together. And there, the name of this study is Upper Body Strength Measures and Pop-Up Performance of Stronger and Weaker Surfers. So what they were actually trying to figure out in this one was, are there certain upper body strength measures that uh, are related to the pop-up? And the second goal was, is there a difference between stronger and weaker surfers? And so, you know, I'm not going to go through kind of the setup of everything, but they basically, uh, for the upper body strength measures, they used an isometric push-up, a dynamic push-up, a force plate pop-up, and then they also measured an in-water pop-up. And so there's a table here that I'm looking at that has the different uh, forces for each of these. So you have an isometric push-up um, was about 981 newtons, plus or minus 300. The relative uh, force uh, in terms of body weight is 1.83 um, per unit of body weight. The dynamic push-up was 1.5 newtons per unit of body weight. Okay, so, you know, with the, the isometric where you're going slow and you're not you're not blasting off of the, the ground, it's very slow and controlled, uh, there's more force being used per unit of body weight. Uh, for a dynamic push-up, there's less force being used um, because you're moving through the, the uh, my assumption is that you're moving through it uh, so quickly that it, it moves your body weight um, and lightens everything up. Uh, the force place uh, f- force plate pop up relative force was even less than the dynamic push up. Um, so, like a dynamic push up would be like you know like the push up with the clap in between where you're actually blasting off of the off the ground. Um, but the uh, the force plate pop up is a full movement and it's a dry land pop up, and its relative force was uh, 1.4 newtons per unit of body weight. So so just to compare that to the isometric pu- push-up where you're not blasting off the ground, that's 1.83 newtons per unit of body weight. The dynamic push-up, which you're blasting off the ground, is 1.5, so less per unit of body weight. That's newtons per body weight. And then the force plate pop-up is 1.4 newtons per unit of body weight. So so it's even more so that that you're using less and less force when you actually start to think of this idea of getting to your feet. Um, they also measured the time 
of the pop-up when they were doing the force plate and that was 0.62 seconds give or take about uh, a hundredth of a second now in my studies and, and again mine are amateur studies uh when i look at the pop-up i found that the the general range for the time of the pop-up is between a half a second and a second and a half sometimes two seconds it also depends on how you define that. I always define it as when the hands are going to the surfboard and it starts to then press down to when you find stabilization or you land. So that's kind of how I measured it. Uh, it. I should be more clear on this. When you land, when your feet land and it appears that the surfer has stabilization. So, so both of those combined. It's not when you land but you don't have stabilization. It's you land and it appears you have stabilization. So what I've found in my amateur studies of looking through video in in water pop up, we're looking at a half second to about a second and a half. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this this force plate pop up time of about 0.62 it falls within that range, but it's pretty quick. Um, it's on the lower end. So it, de it also depends on when they measured it. So they measured it when the chest comes off of the surfboard, which I start the measurement a little bit before then um, in terms of how I clock it. So that would, that would explain why theirs is a little bit faster. Um, and they're not, they're, they're ending it when the feet land. So again, you know, we're in the ballpark. Now, the in-water pop-up time is 0.64 seconds that they measured in water pop-up. So this is the study in which this is the one exception where they actually looked at the water um, and in water catching a wave. What they tried to do, they tried to make sure that the waves were about the same size, the same conditions, the same people on the same boards. And they found, you know, basically some, some, some averages here, the mean, um, of about 0.64 seconds for the time of the pop-up. Again, their definition of the pop-up start and end time was different than mine, but again, we're in the ballpark. But that's really interesting already that the dry land force time was 0.62, the in water was about 0.64. So they had it pretty close to each other. Now, I've seen a lot uh, more differences between on land in flat water. I'll have clients actually do the pop-up on flat water on a SUP board. So that's just a little bit more instability than on land. And then I'll also study what they're doing in the water catching a wave as well. Um, and so it was, it was interesting, like I've seen differences in time, um, but again, I don't care so much about time. I care more about control and I'll get to that in a little bit why that is. Um, but this was some of the, the information that was put out of it. So that was one goal of it was, can we, can we associate uh, upper body strength measures to the pop-up. And that's what they did. They did it. Um, and so they're relating them there and they're finding correlations between them. Now, the second part of their study was to see, well, what is the relationship between a stronger group of human beings? So this was not gender split um, and a weaker group of um uh, of human beings doing these motions. So they did the isometric push-up, they did the dynamic push-up, they did the force plate pop-up, and they did the in-water pop-up. And they had a few anomalies in these groups, which was really interesting. But you can, you can see on the screen, and I'll describe it uh, for those of you guys that are in your car or just listening to this, that the, the normalized force, and so th I use normalized because it, it factors in their body weight, so it's newtons per unit of body weight. Um, so the isometric push-up for the stronger group was 2.16 newtons. Uh, the weaker group was 1.49 newtons. So you could see there was quite a, a, a large difference there. The dynamic push-up was 1.62 newtons. The weaker group for the stronger group, the weaker group was 1.39 newtons um, for the dynamic push-up. The force plate pop-up, so the dry land pop-up, the normalized force for the stronger group was 1.48 newtons. The weaker group wasn't that big of a difference um 1.33 newtons so you know not not too significantly less the time on dry land though this is what they were trying to relate the stronger group's time was 0.59 seconds give or take 
uh, eight tenths, uh, eight hundredths of a second. The weaker group was 0.66 seconds, give or take eight hundredths of a second. So um, that was a little bit more significant in terms of the difference. So 0.59 versus 0.66 for the weaker group. So even though the normalized force on the force plate, and this is again, this is the dry land pop up, the time to do the pop up itself. So the force was you know not a huge difference i would say 1.48 newtons to 1.33 newtons not a huge difference in my mind but the time was a little bit more significant uh, 0.59 versus 0.66 now the last piece of information that we have here is that the time to the pop-up in the water was really interesting the stronger group was 0.62 seconds and the weaker group was 0.66 seconds though the weaker group had more anomalies the 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 range of error uh, was plus or minus nine hundredths of a second versus the stronger group was a little bit tighter it was only six hundredths of a second um, and they actually explain it later in the study how two people in the weaker group had lower than usual um, isometric push-up, dynamic push-up, and force plate pop-up um, uh, measurements in terms of force, but their speed was actually two of the fastest that they studied, which was really interesting. So those two kind of anomalies, they were quick, but they weren't pushing really strong. Um, and they associated to um, skill. So, you know, they they were a little bit more skilled than some of the people in the stronger group um, at, at, at getting to their feet and, and, and stabilizing the surfboard uh, in essence. So it was, a, that was an interesting one, but, but it, at the end of the day, this study does, uh, does show a bit of a correlation between uh, being stronger with your upper body through these measures, through an isometric push-up and dynamic push-up. Uh, being stronger and having a faster dry land pop up and having a faster in water pop up, though the in water was 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 a little bit closer uh, in, of a difference. So that 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 was that was pretty interesting in this one. Um, though you know the questions that I had during this one really had more to do with now. Do you need a lot of strength? Because you have these two anomalies in there uh, in the cohort that that were had a quicker time to pop up. Um, and, you know, they, they were weaker in general. So does strength really matter? And where in the motion does it matter? Um, and so, you know, they, they even explain that, you know, this is, this was, uh, this, these were anomalies and this actually opens up more questions, right? Um, faster participants from the weaker group may have possessed a highly refined skill level, despite lacking a threshold of strength compared with the mean within its cohort. Um, so this is just, they fully understand that, you know, that there's more to be done here. Um, but this sends us down an, another kind of question road. So I'm going to move on to the next kind of strength pop up. And this one was called specifically strength, uh, sex differences in competitive surfers, generic and specific strength capacity. And this was done by, um, uh, members, researchers uh, in at the University of the Basque Country in Spain um, and University of Hawaii in Manoa, um, in uh, Manoa, Honolulu. Um, and this one I found quite interesting. Now, this one was uh, 2019. And so this was two years after that last one we just saw. Um, and this one breaks it down even more. So essentially what they did was they took, they wanted to know whether there was a correlation between a member's what they called counter movement jump, which is basically just a standing um, squat jump, and the pop up motion. So was there was there was there any correlation between them? They had eighty three surfers um, divided according to sex and age. So I thought this was really cool too. Um, there was a lot of information, but they really broke down all these movements into specific 
parts of the movement. So I'm not going to go into, again, the details of them in, in great detail, but they did find a couple interesting things with, you know, just the squat jump itself. Uh, males typically had a, a, a higher hang time in just the squat jump um, than females. Um, there were some interesting ones that they came up with in terms of age, but I want to get down to the main thing, which was the, really the pop-up phase uh, and, and how they kind of broke this down. So I'm, I'm going to show um, first just a, uh, picture here a figure uh it was during the pop-up motion the time um and the force the the vertical ground reaction force in newtons and and they broke it down into step by step by step so they had the pop-up they had the push um they had uh, leg leg movement minimal force they the next phase was what they called the reach phase um the the landing phase leg you know landing on the leg uh landing on their feet they had the force of the landing um the time to stabilization which i think is extremely important as well um and so and so what they found was once again generally men applied more force with their upper body okay so starting with the first phase actually let me step back the time from when it starts to when they stabilize is right within that so it starts at about 1.25 seconds when this force place starts and they stabilize right around two and a half seconds so the total time you know, matching my definition of the pop-up is about 1.25 seconds. So that's that's right in that range, half second to a second and a half. So um, again, it's just for my own like confirmation, I, I was going to these studies to just confirm what I was seeing on video and in, in real life. So getting back to, to these phases now, men had a higher correlation between the force plate uh, of their upper body and they ended up having a faster time to pop up um, than women so i'll start with that that's consistent with the last study that we saw however the pop-up landing phase force ended up being less for women than for men now, so let's think about this the landing force when the feet land right women landed with less force kind of makes sense but it's less force per unit of body weight so the body weight was normalized but they used less force to get to their feet and they when they landed they were softer on their feet right i would argue that that's much more important landing softly than landing hard now again they observed this they discussed what it might mean for surfers but this is starting to go down the road of answering our question what's more important is strength really that important i think i think a hypothesis would be that yeah there's probably a minimum amount of strength that you need to go through the motion upper body strength but when you land, that could be arguably uh, more important. The time to stabilization was shorter for the women than the men. Time to stabilization. And I would argue that that's much more important than how fast or how much force is being used. Because our goal is to control the surfboard. In many of these studies, they talk about all the different things that have to happen um, after you get to your feet and you stabilize. You need to be able to control and turn the board or move the board or manipulate the board with whatever the wave is giving you. Sometimes you need to brake. Sometimes you need to accelerate. And in another study that I'm going to show in a little bit, we talk, they, they talk a lot about that, the, the, the the kinetics, the kinematics of what's going on and the overall goal. So this is the first study that I saw that, you know, there, there was a lot of great insight into this, 
But this was the first study that really discussed the landing force. And, and, and I guess from another practical point of view, it's better to buy surfboards from women because they're going to be less dense in them. <laughs> uh, you look at my boards and boy, oh boy, they got a bunch of pressure dings in them. So nobody wants to buy my boards. Uh, but <laughs> that's just, you know, joking aside, that that might supersede the speed. Again, it goes back to making sure that we find out what our overall goal is. And our overall goal is to stabilize and control the surfboard. I think that that is by far the the number one thing that we need to, to learn uh, and be um, uh, training. So, the, the the one uh, shifting gears to a another study here we are going to look at the um just a, a very quick overview of of a mobility study that was done back in uh, i think it was 2010 i want to say oh yeah 2010 so this was uh, it's called alternative pop-up for surfers with low back pain and this was actually done out of the central central michigan university um so this one looked at uh, a, a nice breakdown of a, a normal pop-up motion where you're, you're bringing your feet underneath you on a long board, again, on dry land, and stabilizing onto your feet versus going to your knees first. So it wanted to study not only the time, and again, the timing, again, is, is working with what I found anywhere between a second and um, uh, a, a, a second uh, well, averaging about half second to a second and a half, somewhere in that in that zone of stabilization. But what they found is that yeah, there was less um, sag sagittal plane motion of the lumbar spine during the pop up um, it, when you're going to your knees first versus what they call it a prone pop up where you're just going straight to your feet. Um, there's less sagittational plane sa sagittal plane motion of the lumbar spine um, and that could you know lead to less pain so that was kind of what they're they're referring to um, I'm not you know if you can go right to your feet uh, without pain we do it um, I'm, I'm not opposed to people going to their knees but I don't teach that uh, we try to avoid that as much as possible because it's once you're on your knees now you got to you ha you still need to control the board um, the timing was really interesting. The timing difference was really interesting. Um, they said it was about 1.3 seconds to a stable stance with the uh, normal prone pop-up and of only about two seconds to a stable stance for knee pop-ups. And that's where I am going to call in the ocean environment. It's much longer than two seconds. Here they move from from knee to they jump to their feet. Whereas a lot of people that are going to their knees are still doing kind of a two to three stage pop-up where they're placing one leg down and then standing up. This is almost like a mini pop-up with from the knees to their feet. They're doing almost like a mini pop-up and that's about two seconds. So that's where I think, you know, this study is a little bit flawed in that sense where in reality, your people that are going to their knees are that have lumbar issues are, are really, they're not, they're not popping up even once they're on their knees, they're not popping to their feet at that point. Um, so, but it does, it does kind of lead us down a new road that says, well, maybe we should study that. Maybe we should study that second one. Um, at the end of the day, I don't teach the knee getting up uh, on the knees. Um, because we are looking to uh, control the surfboard. And it's more difficult to control it when you're on your knees than when you're on your feet, arguably. So I'm going to move on from that one, and I'm going to get into the last set of studies um, that really actually start to look at the biomechanics of the movement. So this uh, researcher, Marcio, Borganovo Santos. I hope, Marcio, I am pronouncing your name correctly. Um, Marcio sent me a, a few studies back in the day on paddling, and he also included some of his pop-up studies. And he's been he's been at this for a while. He's out of a uh, university uh, in Portugal called Porto, 
uh, the biomechanics lab of Porto. Um, and back in 2015, he started this study with several of his co-workers, uh, co, uh, co-researchers and um, others at the University of Otago in New Zealand. And what they did was they tried to analyze the kinetic movement of the pop-up with force plates. Um, so again, all dry land based, but they did find that um, the body reaches a force representing about 150% of the body weight. Now on those other studies that I showed, they were finding something similar in terms of uh, the percentage of the body weight when they actually press down, it it ends up being about 150 to 160% of their body weight that is being applied. Um, Less so for women. That's what we found in the last one. Um, And uh, what I like about how he set this up is once again, there was... Uh, kind of a push-up phase he included what's called a flight phase which in his new study was more transition the he calls a reach phase which is when the feet reach its final destination and then there's a stabilization phase and so uh, once again it was about one and a half to two seconds to in that whole entire sequence Um, he had the force plates down the left hand right hand we're doing approximately the same maybe at slightly different times and then they also measured the front foot and back foot changes so uh, you know in the in the in the in the landing or what they call the reaching phase it showed that the front foot um, added more force than the back foot generally speaking um, and this was just a just a pictor a picture of it um, they didn't give a ton of data in this, um, but uh, they did provide a little bit of of the, of the data. So the front foot reaches the surfboard with a force that represent 118% of the body mass and the back foot with 36% of the body mass. Um, when both feet land, they apply a force on the surfboard that represent about 153% uh, of their body weight. So that's where that you know, 150% of the body weight kind of comes from. So they're pressing down and then they're landing um, pretty heavily, whereas women are landing much softer. Again, I'm thinking that's going to be more um, what we're looking for. Now, this was back in 2015. This was kind of the start of him thinking about measuring the pop-up a little bit more. And so I want to move on to a more recent study that, that Marcio did and it was a cross study with a lot more people. So this one was done in 2021. Um, and this was, it's called, Are the Kinetics and Kinematics of the Surf Pop-Up Related to the Anthropometric Characteristics of the Surfer? <clears throat> I'll, I'll try to explain what that means in a second, but <laughs> I want to show some of the results from the from this. So this was Marcio teaming up with several other researchers. Another friend of ours uh, down at CSU San Marcos, Jeff Nessler, was a part of that. So it was uh, the the, the uh, University of Porto in Portugal. It uh, it also included the State University of Campinas in Brazil, uh, at the the Cal State University San Marcos. So that was Jeff uh, and. Uh, another uh, rehab and clinical biometrics lab in in Florinopolis, Brazil. So it was a collaboration of all of these researchers and scientists. And Marcio was able to take this a little bit deeper and really look at the breakdown. So similar to the study done um, where we found the different parts of the pop-up and the the amount of force, um, this one kind of broke down a little bit of you know hand dominance, um, the the stance regular versus goofy, which they didn't find any difference between hand dominance or regular goofy. Everything was the same there, so there wasn't much there. They used um, motion capture, which I thought was really neat, with force plates. So similar to Marcio's original plan, but now they've got the motion capture to also show the movement. Um, they broke it down into different. Um, segments and what they were telling the participants to do was um, ask to simulate three or four paddling strokes then perform the pop-up so if if the server's hands were not totally on the force plates they they asked the server to move 
to where the the for, they were on the force plates. Um, they were they they were really discouraged. Well, they didn't explain like, all right, well, what scenario would you be in? Is it a steep wave? Is it a flat wave? Are you going left? Are you going right? The research tried. The researchers tried not to impose anything like that, but but specifically stated that in the ocean environment, the pop up technique and movement is most likely going to be different based on the scenario that you're in. Because in some instances, you're trying to slow down. You're actually going to lean back on the tail. In some instances, you want more acceleration and you want to maintain speed. And so you're going to end up a little bit more on your front foot. Or you want to engage the rail on your uh, on one rail over the other, right? And so they would maybe lean a little bit left or right during the motion. So this was as, as pure as they could as they could set it up without creating any bias in the surfer's mind. So what I specifically like, let me move down to this, the area of the kinematics that I specifically liked, um, was once again, showing the time and some transitions. So they had, uh, they had the paddling and they didn't start the motion until there was the push phase. So the push phase, and then they had this transition, into the reaching in, and then stabilizing and they ended it. So they were finding that the average time for the full stabilization from pushing to stabilization was about 1.2 seconds. So once again, I love that, you know, we're finding that kind of average being, you know, between depending on how you define it, but between half a second to a second and a half, roughly in that range. Um, they did show, once again, that the landing or the reaching phase uh, was was similar in terms of the percentage of their body weight. So it was similar to his previous study where when they were landing, it was pretty heavy. Um, and what I liked about this was that they got rid of what he called the flight phase and he just called it a transition. Now, it wasn't exactly explained, but there were a group of people that had more of what they call a wipe transition and other group that had more of an overlap transition. And what I am going to assume that meant was that uh, the wipe transition was where the surfer was staying in contact with the surfboard, whereas the overlap was where they kind of lifted off or popped a little bit more. Um, and they did explain, I think it was a majority of the people were more of like that wipe. Yeah. 57% of the participants exhibited a brief flight phase. So more of the overlap, whereas 43% maintained contact with the simulated board throughout the entire motion. Um, and, and again, this is where they're talking about, you know, when you're staying in contact with the surfboard, presumably you are able to control the board's pitch and roll, uh, increasing or decreasing drag to accelerate or break according to the situation that you're in. Right. And so they, they didn't, they didn't bias the participants by telling them what the situation was. And so these were just their normal kind of movements. So um, in this one, they the maximum load reached approximately 160% of the body weight. So when they landed, when they reached their position and then stabilized. Um, and they had a difference between um, men and women. The current results demonstrate that the relative, relative push peak force was slightly higher than the value reported in the literature. Um, 0.95 newtons per unit of body weight for men and 0.81 newtons for women. Um, but again, I don't think that that matters, the push phase. I think what matters is when they land. And that really is the takeaway from all of these is how well are we actually controlling the surfboard when we land? And I think that all of these researchers are starting to get this, lead us down this road. Um, you know, I'd, I would love a suggestion if anybody's listening, Marcio, if you're listening right now, or Jeff, repeat these same studies, but on flat water, if you can, you know, try to get a, a, 
force plate. And I think you guys have tried force plate on a surfboard in water, but just try it instead of being on a wave, just try it in flat water on like a sup, you know, and see if there's a difference with that kind of instability, because the brain acts a little bit different when you have to stabilize on, when you have to stabilize something that's less stable than the ground. And then maybe move into the wave catching environment and try to do this on the wave catching environment. Um, that I think you're going to need to do at the wave pools, which I think Jeff and I have discussed and, and Sean have, have, have discussed doing it. And I think they have done a little bit of it. So what these studies really done, they, they, they help us with a training regiment, obviously. Uh, I think that having a minimal amount of physical um, stability and upper body strength and strength as well as in the legs and the feet to stabilize the board is important. It helps us identify any physical limitations that we might have that we have to go to a physical therapist for or work on some mobility so that we can make these movements. What they're not, they're doing a little bit of the learning specific motor movements. Um, I think we've alluded to that but we, these studies haven't specifically outlined exactly what those motor movements are. They just are explaining what the results are of these studies. So they're not relating it to performance, though one of the studies said that a faster pop-up is going to improve performance because you get to your feet faster and you're able to control the board more. Now, I would argue that a more accurate and speed to stabilization is more important than overall speed to your feet. And I think that it, you know, with some discussion, they may agree with me on that one is that it's really about how fast you can get to stabilizing on your feet, not how fast the motion can be. So let's say you can do it in one second. You can do the motion in one second, but when you land, you're completely unstable and the board turns. Whereas if it, you know, it's maybe a one point three seconds to get to your feet, but have stability in that motion of getting to your feet. Not the time to stabilization after you land. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about throughout the whole motion, going a little bit slower so that you can stabilize. And whatever that motion is, is the preferred method. Now, there's a lot of different methods out there for pop-up. I'm not going to go into them. There's, there's, there are coaches out there that teach lots of different methods, and each one has its benefits. But what I am going to explain is that whatever method you end up using, you need to identify two absolutes in the pop-up. There are, there are two absolutes that happen. Based on all of this research that we've found, it supports this philosophy. So I'm, I'm going to share with you what I share with a lot of my level two clients, not the exercise itself that, that helps you work towards that, but something that you can think about when you're getting your feet or when you're practicing getting your feet. The first absolute that absolutely needs to happen when you stop paddling and you start to get up to your feet is that you must have control of the surfboard. And I know that sounds so basic and fundamental, but a lot of people don't think about this. It's if we go deeper into this thought is that you need to have control of the surfboard's pitch or horizontal balance and roll or lateral balance. So in all of these studies, for example, when people are pushing up in the pushing phase, the left and right hands are generally applying the same amount of force. But if you were on water, well, I should, I should take that back. Actually, a lot of these studies show that the left and right are not pushing the same amount of force at the same time. They're slightly off in general in many of these. Um, and so if the left and right are slightly off, I'll go back to, I believe it was, yeah. This was Marcio's original one. The left and right, you can see during the impulsion phase, the left and right are pushing slightly different forces at different times, right? So if that's the case, guess what? If you're pushing down more with your left than with your right, you're going to turn left in the motion of getting to your feet. Now, do you want to do that? If so, go ahead and do it, right? If you have control over it, awesome, do it. 
But if you don't even know you're doing that, you should investigate that. And it's simple. You just videotape yourself. You don't need a force plate. Force plate will give you the actual data, but just videotape yourself from the front and go through your pop-up motion. Are you applying more force to one side or the other throughout the entire motion? And when you land, are you applying more force to one side or the other? Because again, when you transition to stabilization onto your feet, <laughs> if you're more on your toes versus your heels, you're going to turn in water. And that's why I think this is all important to do these studies on flat water on a sup, because that might provide us with a little bit more insight into what the participant's brain actually does when they catch a wave on something that's a little bit less stable. So the first absolute thing that we need is we need control of the surfboard's pitch and roll throughout the whole motion. Now, again, if, if you are on a steep wave and you're trying to set the rail early while you're getting to your feet, as long as you are engaging it and that's what you want, go ahead and do that. But if you're doing it without knowing, and that's where I'd say 90% of the participants that come to me in level two and we do this exercise, 90% of them don't even know that they're actually applying a little bit more force to one side or the other. No, just on land, just on land. And, and I understand that land is different than when you're in the water. But one could argue that if your brain is not thinking about it on land, guess what? Your brain is not thinking about it in the water. And that leads us to our second absolute. In all of these studies, it's showing that the time it takes us to start and end the motion is anywhere between a half second and a second and a half to two seconds, right? So if we, you know, one was 0.6, one was 1.2, one was 1.5, um, so it's somewhere in that range, right? And that's pretty quick. That is pretty quick. And if you're on an unstable surface, not a lot of time there to think about anything consciously, right? Because it's so quick, because our brains can't process conscious thought that quick, because, I mean, it, this is a very complex movement in one second. Let's just average it to be one second. It's going to be one second. This whole thing happens in one second. How are you possibly thinking about anything consciously about, about how your arm is or how your knee is or how your hips are, you know, and how you're moving all that? How is it even possible for you to train that over and over and over again while thinking about it? You can't do it on the water. You can't do it when you catch a wave. That's where the dry land exercises are a bit helpful in that you can slow it down. Now, my dry land exercise is vastly different than many people's dry land exercises. And so I'm not going to share with that with you right now. That's for the people that have taken my level two course. But what it does is it the result of doing it over and over again fulfills the two absolutes. You learn how to do the motion over and over and over again without thought, unconscious thought, because you're able to do it over and over and over again without wearing yourself out. So that, that fulfills number two, because it's so quick. Number two absolute is that we need to train this to be an unconscious movement. Well, if you're catching a wave and you're thinking about your pop-up, guess what? You're going to fall. I, I, I'd put money on in Vegas on that most of the time. Or the probability of success goes down dramatically. And again, I'm a math guy, so I always do probabilities. So the second absolute, which is this motion needs to be unconscious movement. You need to figure out how to train a movement, whatever movement you think controls the board. And you need to do it over and 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 over again with good quality. So the current just do pop-ups on dry land doesn't achieve that. I'm sorry to say. Uh, every time I videotape someone doing their regular pop-up on dry land, they're not able to control the board, the, the hypothetical board on the ground. 
there's always more pushing to the left or the right or they're landing on their toes or their heels too much and they don't even know it. They're disconnecting from the board. Even those that aren't disconnecting from the board have a bit of lean one way or another. Now, I would say that's in 90% of the students. The other 10%, a little bit different. They're connect. They're staying connected with the board. They, either through experience, have learned how to make this movement so that they have control to stay flat, to turn left, to turn right, to stall. Remember, we? I don't think we really talked about that, but the you know the pitch, the horizontal balance, there are some waves that you actually want to slow down while you're getting to your feet. And there are some waves that you want to keep that momentum that you just created by paddling in the wave. You want to keep that while getting to your feet. So, you know, the, whatever exercise that you come up with, whatever technique that, that, that suits you, and your mobility, strength, uh, preference, it has to, has to be trained to teach you how to control the surfboard's pitch and roll. And it has to become an unconscious movement, which means I mean, if we look at motor learning over the years, it's doing it high quality over and over again, not low quality. The regular pop-up tends to make people do low quality reps over and over again, and you get pretty tired. And so usually when you get more tired sooner, you don't get as much reps in and it's of lower quality. And so your brain is going to say, oh, well, they're just going to do that over and over again. I'm going to make that process easy for the brain and turn it into unconscious thought, but it'll be the wrong motion. You'll lose control of the surfboard. So again, find something that, that can uh, fulfill those two absolutes. Control the surfboard's pitch and roll and become unconscious thought. And that's all I got for you, man, for the pop-up, the science behind the pop-up. I'm hoping that some of these guys are listening to the podcast. If not, I'll send it to them. And they can update us on some of the research that they're doing, which would be awesome. You know, see if there's anything new out there. Um, but uh, in the meantime, I hope this helped. I hope they got your brain thinking a little bit. And if you guys have any questions, uh, let me know. Uh, until then, I'll see you in the water.